Hello, everyone. You're listening to episode 18 of the Merge Marketing Podcast. Today, we have one of Canada's leading wellness experts on the show and the CEO of three growing enterprises. The stories and lessons that are going to be shared with you today are not ones that you'll want to miss. So without further ado, let's merge over to the episode with Margaret Wallace Duffy. You're listening to the Merged Marketing Podcast with David Louch and Jason Hunt. This is a show all about unlocking the marketing tactics and secrets behind everyday brands. Each week, we'll bring you expert commentary so that you can make better choices when it comes to growing your business. Thank you for spending time with us. Now let the show begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you and welcome to the Merge Marketing Podcast. Our guest today is Margaret Wallace Duffy, a dynamic wellness advocate known for her engaging and contagious attitude and is a much sought after keynote speaker for numerous corporate and public events throughout North America. As one of Canada's leading wellness experts, many media outlets across Canada often call upon her expertise. You may recognize Margaret from television shows such as City Line, The Five on City TV, Health Matters on Rogers, Better Canadian Living TV on CTV, and The Food Network, just to name a few. Today, she motivates so many through producing and hosting her ultra-informative web TV shows on her Wow New Media YouTube channel and TV Kojiko. Margaret's expertise is in high demand. She has had articles published in Canadian Living, Today's Parent, and she has also been chosen as the national media spokesperson for companies such as Loblaws Canada, Johnson & Johnson, and Boreon Laboratories, just to name a few. From her humble beginnings as a registered massage therapist to being the CEO of three growing enterprises, Margaret has been driven by her famous motto, attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? Margaret, welcome to our show today. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, we are super thrilled to be speaking with you today. So basically, as I mentioned in your intro, um, your humble be- humble beginnings, that is kind of where we want to start with today's episode. So the success that you've achieved so far in your career is quite impressive, to say the least. Um, you, you've adapted to changing times and gone against the grain in many cases, which we love. Uh, so let's start at the beginning with your with your first business and then work our way up to to where you are today and how you got there. Well, thanks, David, and thanks for your kind words. Uh, it has been quite a journey, and and I love sharing my journey because I, I re- truly believe that the journey I am on has been meant to help inspire and empower others to to go on their own journey. And and like many people, we all have a story. And I opened Wallace for Wellness, an integrative health clinic, twenty eight years ago, with a, a big vision in mind: one that would bring complementary and conventional healthcare professionals together under one roof to learn from one another, to grow from one another, but most importantly, to put the patient at the center and help empower them to become the CEO of their own health. But I got to tell you, almost twenty you know twenty eight years ago with that vision, integrative preventative health was not in the consciousness of most people at that time. In fact, my own family, my my undergrad is in kinesiology from the University of Waterloo, and I'm, I'm a big science girl. And when I told my family I was going to do this thing in integrative health, you know, David, I thought, you know, quite frankly, they thought I was hugging a tree and howling at the moon. Like, what, what did that mean? Right? What did that mean? Well, I had a vision and and the reason I had this vision of a better together approach to healthcare was because of my own personal health story. And I think often in business, great ideas come from personal experiences. And my story, my own health story at a very young age was a very difficult one. And I won't get into all the details, but I'll sort of do a summary that kind of puts things into perspective. When you've gone through 10 surgeries, four bowel obstructions, a lung collapse, a fecal transplant, that's right, a poop transplant, just like on Grey's Anatomy, my son was my donor. And then as a woman, I went through menopause at the age of 39, young. Um, You you start to recognize the gaps in 
in where the system is failing you, that where mm. you struggled to find help, which motivated me to want to open a clinic that would bring both conventional and complementary medical professionals together to help me play a more active role in my health, to, to put aside this pill for an ill, wait till it's broken mentality. Because as a young woman, I wanted to live well. I wanted, you know, I had ambitions, um, but I really struggled to find the help. And I'm not here to, to in any way uh, denigrate or put down our, our conventional medical community here in Canada. I am a proud Canadian. We are so blessed um, mm -hmm. to have the healthcare system that we do. But I recognize early on that there was real importance, and that was in prevention and patient empowerment. And so that's where I embarked on my integrative health clinic, and I called it strategically back then, uh, Wallace and Associates. And why did I do that? Well, for two reasons. First of all, it sounded like there would be more than one of me. And at the time, it was just me. It, it, I casted a vision. Yeah. Um, but it also sounded almost like a law firm. And I got to tell you, as a registered massage therapist with a background in kinesiology, 30 year, almost 30 years ago, massage therapy wasn't what it is today. And so I wanted to, it to sound ultra professional, ultra um, health oriented and evidence informed. And so people would say, oh, it sounds like a law firm. And I thought, perfect. I was setting the tone of my business and projecting what I wanted moving forward. Now, when we fast forward 28 years later, um, and so much change in our healthcare system, although there's still a lot more room to, to grow and improve. We do have an integrative clinic. The clinic is 90% doctor referral. We have massage therapists and, and naturopaths and medical doctors and counselors and chiropractors and, and on and on and on. So I think that that's the foundation of my business. And then the other businesses have grown from there. Mm -hmm. When you look at, uh, when you, I love the term that you say everyone should be the CEO of their own health, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and because, you know, because Margaret, you know, you're in touch with a lot of different people on a regular basis about their health. What percentage of people do you think actually value health the same way, like the same way a CEO uh, takes control of a company? That's such a great question. And I think it's changed. And that's what excites me to no end right now. I think we're at a time in history where people, Canadians, are wanting to have more control of their own health. They are seeing that this pill for nail, wait till it's broken, let oh hip save us mentality isn't working. It's not what they want. They want to play a more active role. They may not know how quite yet, but they are searching out a means by which to do that. And so we've positioned ourselves and that's what, you know, why I'm so passionate about education and, the, and my other businesses that have spawned from a result of that passion, because people do want to play more of a CEO in their health. Do I think it's always been that way? Absolutely not, David. I don't think people think that way. They go like passive Trojans to their doctor and say, fix me, doc. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the mentality is shifting. Now they're saying, well, hang on a minute. Well, you're giving me that medication, but why? And do I have another option? They're more inquisitive. They're, they're challenging um, to, to find out other ways to support their health. You will never hear me use the word alternative medicine. I don't believe it should be an us versus them approach. And so I'm hearing that from Canadians. I'm hearing that, well, what about augmenting what my doctor is already doing? How can I be involved and be have more of a CEO mindset in my health? Because after all, without our health, nothing else matters. Our businesses aren't going to be healthy. Our relationships aren't going to be healthy. We won't financially be sound. So I think people are starting to shift. But what a great question, because it's taken a long time. And there's still a lot of work to go because our system has been set up for us to play a more passive role. But I'm so excited that that's changing. And I'm determined to be the impetus to continue to that for that change to, con to, to be even greater. I think it's safe to say, you know, with COVID, that has almost amplified the sentiment, hasn't it? It sure has. And what I what excites me as much as this is a very difficult time for all of us in the world, pushed pause, and it's scary, and it's got our attention. Our leading healthcare professionals in conventional medicine are saying, you, you and I, each and every one of us play a role in this. Our actions matter. Or what we do or don't do is going to have an impact on, on the collective. 
this is how our system should always work, not just in a crisis, not just during COVID, but day to day in our mental and physical well-being. We have so many crises uh, apart from COVID, the mental health crisis, the opiate crisis. If we only had more of a mindset that our own actions will impact not only ourselves, but others, and that we can take control of our health, we can put the actions into place so that we are actually going to see the benefits to our health, both short term and long term. And then what the benefit that's going to have to the, the business of healthcare to the bottom line in our country, which also impacts all of us. So you're right, COVID has really quickly made us all recognize that even more. My hope is that moving forward, that's going to allow people to really want to even more become the CEO of their health and boost their immunity, but not just because we now have a virus and we're waiting for a vaccine, but because we have the ability to control our behavior and the outcome it will have on our health. Yeah, and let me ask this because I, you know, first of all, I'm a, I'm a believer in being the CEO of your health and this integrative approach to to your own health that um, you preach and that we should all have. But if we move into that direction where individuals are taking more of a responsibility to um, be inquisitive and find different ways to to cure their everyday issues, whatever it might be. Is that going to burden our healthcare system even more with the current way that it is set up? Because wouldn't wouldn't it require more resources because people are are investing more and asking more questions and wanting more tests to be done? You know, that's an an interesting perspective. And and do I think that this can change overnight? Listen, I've been almost 30 mm-hmm. years of my career and it's there's it's slowly pivoting and changing and evolving. And and I don't anticipate there's going to be you know massive change overnight. But we have mm-hmm. to start somewhere. And I I do need to reiterate that it we must work in collaboration with conventional medicine and our system as a whole. We can't go off on our own and not be partnered with. But I do think um, what we can do is really look at preventative health. What can we be doing in our day-to-day with our nutrition, with our mindset, with our movement to prevent illness um, so we aren't straining the healthcare system? And what about also the fact of living well? Well, we do it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot yeah. of people in our in our conventional medical system, people are living longer, but I always ask the question, but are they living well? And yeah. so, you know, there, there's that balance that we have to take. And you're absolutely right. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of collaboration and a collaboration of all parties, government, healthcare, everyday people, um, you know, schools, are, the, the way we are, are taught it, we need to come together and look at how do we balance working better together as one, um, but also recognizing that this can't happen overnight, but with small, simple changes, it's a compounding effect. We start to see, just like social distancing has taught us, by small things each and every day that that when you walk outside, you don't see the virus, you don't see the impact necessarily it's having. But yet we're still inside our houses and now we're seeing the impact it's having on that curve. I think we will have the same effect if we take that mentality and look at the way we're going to change our system over time. But it will take some patience. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say is people need to deploy patience. I mean, two weeks ago, let's just take two weeks ago compared to today and just watch the news two weeks ago compared to today and seeing how people are reacting. And I think this is almost inevitable that you were going to start, we're going to start to see protests and people mm-hmm. really coming to their boiling point of staying in, in quarantine and self-isolating and exhibiting social distancing. But I, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's a matter. I think that's the biggest challenge is getting everybody on board for deploying that patients. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, w- it won't be easy. And there will be lots of hiccups. I've never shied away from a challenge. I, when I truly believe in something, uh, you know, I will push forward. I think when people start to value and see the results of the actions that they have on themselves, it's so, so empowering, David. I, I think one of the scariest things is uncertainty and a feeling of being out of control. 
And in health, often people feel that way. They get a diagnosis and it's like it's come out of nowhere, but they aren't really looking at what can I do even with a diagnosis to make the best of the situation? How can I help with, in collaboration with my doctor improve the way that I'm feeling? How can I prevent illness? Or when I have it, how do I improve my quality of life? That takes a team. And all I want to keep saying is you have to be part of that team. You cannot have the mentality any longer where you're just going to sit on the sidelines, or you can, but will you live well? No, not necessarily. So we do have to come together and shift the mindset that we're all working better together as one. And that's why I love doing things like what we're doing right now is to spark conversation and to get people thinking differently. Because as you said at the beginning of my bio, attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? We can just be negative. We can look at the pause we've had to take right now with this COVID situation. I truly believe character shows up in crisis. Mm -hmm. And and that goes beyond COVID. That goes, and I, I think because, you know, my history with my own health challenged mm -hmm. from a very young age, mm -hmm. you really see the benefit when you start to feel empowered to make changes in your own life, and you then start to see the results. But in the instant gratification society that we live in, we want something yesterday. And so we have to work on changing that mindset. The small things we do today, we may not see the immediate results tomorrow, but equally as true, the negative things today, we won't necessarily see the immediate results tomorrow, but you will over time. And so what road are you going to take? The one that's positive and empowered or the one that's going to lead you potentially to being unwell mentally and physically? Absolutely. And I'm curious to, to maybe go back into the, the evolution of your career and of your businesses, because ultimately it, it started out um, with Wallace and Associates and, and what is now Wallace for Wellness Clinic. And, and that was, you know, your clinic where you could see and treat people that came in to, to with, with a specific issue, I would imagine. And then over time, you started to realize all of these different things. And, and then you started to get your message out there. And then your business evolved into two and three and, and, and other or like organizations. So how did it go from the clinic to what you have set up today? Well, it's been an ever evolving um, process. And I think part of it, I have to say this, passion mm -hmm. and persistence is, is to our two key ingredients. I would argue that I'm more passionate now than I was 28 years ago when I opened my clinic. And that's because I continue to lean in, uh, to think outside the box, to challenge myself and to take risks. So how did I go from clinic to then doing television? I think that was kind of the first leap. Well, it started with my passion for education and my need to market even first, just my clinic, you know, as a new business owner and a new grad, and, and I didn't have a lot of money to market my business, I had to find creative ways to market myself. And, and you're going to laugh, David, because um, <laughs> that many years ago, the computers weren't even what they are now. In fact, there wasn't. So I faxed, I faxed. Do you remember, do you know what a fax machine is? <laughs> I, I, I before, do, yeah. It's before David's time, I think. That's right. That's right. Um, I faxed every day for almost a year, the producers at City Line, uh, back when it was Marilyn Dennis as the host. And I was telling them that I needed to be on their show, that I wanted to do some segments um, on a wide range of topics, not just myself, but some of my associates. And I think after many months, they finally thought, this woman's crazy, uh, so they're going to finally talk to me. And they decided, okay, you know what, we won't put you on live TV, but we'll come and we'll do some tape segments with you. My goal initially in doing that was bringing exposure to my clinic. It was a great way to get word out about what I did. Yes, it was on national mm -hmm. TV, and I couldn't treat somebody in Vancouver, but I didn't even think that far ahead. I just thought about how am I going to bring exposure, not only to my clinic, but to my profession. And so once I did that, and then they realized, oh, this is some really good content, and I proved myself there, then they brought me in studio, and I did live television. Now, I got to tell you, I had no business doing television. I'd never done it before, <laughs> but I leaned in, and I believed in myself. I took the risk. And when you follow your passion and you're willing to do the work and take some risk, 
they can pay off. So what did that lead to? Well, that lead to becoming a spokesperson, as you mentioned, because Johnson & Johnson saw me on, on City Line and said, we'd love for you to be a spokesperson for our baby line, which led for me to become, you know, take a media training course so that I knew how to become a media spokesperson. It started off with just marketing my clinic, but the passion underlying was education. That education then led to me now being a media spokesperson. So that became another revenue generation model for me. Now I was being a media spokesperson for many companies. Now I was getting better at doing media work. And then I was asked to host something on Rogers. Well, being a guest on a television show is a very different skill set than actually hosting a, sh a live show where there's a call in. It's a completely different skill set. I have to tell you, and now with the internet, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can Google, don't go digging too deep, but <laughs> I was mortified the first time when you have a control room in your ear saying, look to camera two, and someone in your ear, in your ear is saying, throw to the commercial in, in 10 seconds, and you're trying to interview somebody in front of you, and you haven't done radio and television broadcasting, that's nerve wracking, <laughs> yeah. but I did it and I learned and I don't want to, I don't want you to see the first one I ever did because it was ugly, oh, but, geez. <laughs> but I learned and then I got bit by the media bug and I said, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn what it was like on both sides of the camera as a guest, but I also wanted to learn how to produce, which led me then to have my own show, which led me then to say, well, why am I? why am I doing this for someone else? Why don't I have my own media company? Mm -hmm. what, in fact, why don't I have a new media company? Because about 10, almost 11 years ago now, I was actually um, producing segments for a nationwide television show that, and I was producing health and wellness segments. And the station said to me, we need your content and we need your contact. And, and what do they mean by that? Well, they said, well, we want health and wellness content on our lifestyle show. You can host it. You can create it. You can do all the works. And we'll sell you the media really inexpensively. And you can go out and get sponsors and, and, and we'll put it to air. Well, then all of a sudden, my wheels are turning as an entrepreneur. And I realized, oh, okay, so now I need a media buying contract. My lawyer laughed when I called him and I said, I now need a media buying contract. He said, of course you do. Like, yeah. you know, who am I as a massage therapist to now be selling media? But after doing that successfully, well running a clinic, being a new mom and producing and hosting and having a network put segments to air, I thought, well, why am I doing this for someone else? Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute. I should do this for myself. And that's when, wow, new media. Uh, became a thing. <laughs> That's when I opened Wow New Media. And over 11 years ago, new media was really new then. In fact, when I was talking to broadcasters about, you know, putting segments online, they were resistant. It was not the thing, right? But I had a vision and I stayed with that vision. Don't get me wrong. You know, traditional media will never go away. But as we've seen over the past 10 years, it has morphed and changed tremendously. And we can be better together as one, even in the media business. And so that's kind of how I went from clinic to then education. I was just doing it as a marketing tool, but then realized, oh, wait a minute, now I'm a media spokesperson. Okay, now I'm going to produce segments to go on a national television show. Oh, wait a minute, now I'm going to have a media company so I can produce my own segments with my own media team and my own podcasts. And now it's morphed yet again under the umbrella of Wow New Media, where we have two online learning academies and online publications, magazines, to help empower people to become the CEO of their health. So I think as an entrepreneur, it's a matter of being persistent, passionate, and failing forward and being willing to think outside the box and pivot and change just like I'm doing right now in COVID. I'm pivoting and changing because I can, but that's the mentality I've had even outside of chaos like COVID. And that's what I would in, in really hope that, you know, your listeners, your entrepreneurs, whether they're new entrepreneurs or seasoned, that they'll start to challenge themselves to do is to think differently and translate the skills they have in different ways so they can create different revenue streams. 
Amen. I love everything you said there, Margaret. And, <laughs> and you know, circling a hundred percent and, and, you know, circling back just for a moment, you know, I think one of the, um, you know, the, one of the trends and what you're talking about there is, is putting yourself in situations where you're uncomfortable, whether it's yes. sitting at the studio desk, you know, in, in the TV studio, looking at camera two, whatever it is, people have issues even now putting their smartphone on their face and recording a quick one minute video for Facebook. You know, Indeed. people just, you know, it, it, it puts that on such a kind of micro when, when you talk about all of these kind of uncomfortable circumstances that you have overcome. You know what? And, and I get it. I get it. Uh, what I always say, and I do a lot of media coaching when I put somebody on camera or whether they're going to put content on our learning academy, whether it's our, our Better Together is One Learning Academy, which is for healthcare professionals, or our One Life Learning Academy, which is for everyday people where they can go and learn and take courses. Here's how I got over that uncomfortable fear. Um, and I still use this to this day. At the end of the day, this is not about you. Get out of your own way. This is about your message. This is about your why. And the minute you start to make it about you, I will tell you both candidly, I can't stand the way I sound or look on camera. I can't. I can't stand it. Part I of can that's, relate to that. Yeah, some of that's vanity. Some yeah. of it's just, you know, it, it's human nature. Yet at the end of the day, when I go back to what is my why, what is my passion, and what do I ultimately want to do? I want to empower other people to become the CEO of their health, or I want to empower healthcare professionals to work better together as one so we have a better healthcare system. When I go back to that message, it's not about me. So get out of your own way. I uh, have said to my kids since they were little, live where the butterflies are. That's where the magic happens. If I don't do something every day to make butterflies happen, I'm not challenging myself enough. I'm complacent. I'm not going to see changes in my career and my life because I'm playing it too darn safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, get out of your own way and, and press play, you know, for those people that are worried about how they sound or how they look. And, and that's kind of where I want to go next, because I think you, you can provide insights, um, advice into an area that we have not had anybody on the show able to talk about. You have had shows on big TV networks um, and and now have tr had to transition over to social media and YouTube, which uh, you've done. And what I would love to hear is what that transition has been like going from very formal network television <laughs> to producing and creating and publishing your own content on social media and, and YouTube. Um, yeah. You know, was it, was it an easy transition for you? Because oh, gosh, no. Yeah. No, like it, no way. Well, no, because, well, is it, was it easy? You know what? It's been so much darn fun. It's mm -hmm. been challenging. It's yeah. been, there have been so many um, head banging, door kicking moments. Mm -hmm. It's been trial and error. It's been taking risks. And I, and I think that's the beauty of all of this. And isn't that entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. If you're not going to be willing to pivot, fail forward, get up, dust yourself off, try again, evaluate, uh, look at it and say, okay, what worked? What didn't work? You know, yes, when I did national television stuff and you have an entire crew and a makeup artist and a stylist and, you know, whether I'm doing a television or a commercial that's going to air on city TV and I've got a stylist and a makeup artist and everybody's there doing everything for you. Mm -hmm. And then you've got yourself and you've got to figure out, oh, do I have a ring light? Which way do I put the camera? What do I look like? Do I have proper sound? I mean, there's so many moving parts. I think that's the fun in it. Rather than be fearful of it, embrace the reality of the learning. And I, for me, being a sponge, I am always looking for opportunities to learn. And I can thank both of my parents for that. You know, my father, rest his soul, he's no longer with us, but he was an incredible entrepreneur always willing to take risks and to try new things right up until, you know, we lived to 88. We're never too old to learn. And so I'm always like in new media now, and, and it's also knowing your audience. 
But I've had to pivot and change different platforms. You have to you have to work on differently, right? Instagram is different than Facebook. That's different. But you don't have to do them all. Perfection is not what we're going for. Progression is. And you have to start to evaluate, figure out your audience, give it a try, learn from it, and find mentors. That's why I love doing stuff like this. I am bold enough to ask anybody for help. Mm-hmm. I'm bold enough to learn. I'm bold enough to take the risk and hope that you don't find me on YouTube on that, that time that I did that Rogers thing because it wasn't pretty. And, and interestingly enough, before I did that show, I was with Ann Moore Knight, who's now on CTV. And, and I can remember thinking, oh, he, you know, I saw him take the leap to broadcast from community television, which, by the way, I want to give thumbs up to community television. It's such an important part. And Kojiko is, is airing my podcast as a video podcast. But you have to challenge yourself to try these different things and be willing to fail and learn from them. So has in answer to your question, has it been easy? No. Mm -hmm. But has it been fun? Yes. And am I always looking for ways to try to improve it? 100%. But at the end of the day, if you don't even try it, like you said, if you don't push play, you can't reap the benefit. And there are tips and tricks. I, t- I teach a, a course we're going to make as a webinar. It's called How Are You Being Heard? C- uh, connect, Communicate, Conquer. And whether you're speaking on a stage or through a camera, uh, yes, there's a little bit of a difference when you when you work with the camera because it's it's unsettling, isn't it? When you, when you have to speak to a lens and you're not getting feedback, you have to be more animated. You have to, there's, there, it can be intimidating, mm-hmm. but there are people that are out there to help. Yeah. But the best Maybe. help you can give yourself is trying. And Absolutely. so has, has your marketing strategy changed on the new media platforms, social media, YouTube, whatever it might be? Or is it still the, the exact same, which was ultimately I'm here to provide education? Um, you know what? I always, it's not about me. It's always about what is the end user So whether it's my patient in my clinic, the viewer on my YouTube channel, the listener to my podcast, how am I solving a problem for them? Mm -hmm. This is not about me. So I always lead first, well, two things. I lead with education and my, at at the basis of everything I do, it's about relationship building. You must build a relationship and a rapport and a trust which doesn't happen overnight. And, and you know, throw sit, set your arrogance aside. Um, I don't care how many degrees you have, how much years of success in business. I am humbled every day and grateful every day for the new listener that I get or the new client that I get or whatever that may be. Because at the end of the day, if you always have that mindset of I'm here to serve, mm-hmm. I'm here to educate, I'm here to build a relationship, then you can convert that to sales. Mm-hmm. There are times where you come out in a marketing strategy where, yeah, you're you're asking, there's a call to action and it's blatant. But, you know, success was built overnight. It takes 20 years, right? Or more to get there. I think, <laughs> I think the mentality is, it's the mentality that you have to have. And people, not everyone's your customer, but if you, if people relate to you because you've built a rapport with them, because you're authentic, because you care to solve their problem, then the sales come more easily. And that to me is what you need to focus on. So I really haven't changed my marketing strategy. It's just the vehicle in which I deliver it. But even in my clinic to this day, I put them first. Mm -hmm. How am I helping them? And whether they've been in my clinic, this is the first time I've given them a treatment or they've been coming for 27 years, each and every time, David and Jason, it is my responsibility to make sure they're getting what they need out of this treatment. I don't nail it in. I don't take it for granted just because they've been with me for 20 something years. And I think people notice that. And now a word from our sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Fresh Crowd. Fresh Crowd is a full-service social media agency in Canada that specializes in everything social, from management to community building and advertising. Fresh Crowd can help your business attract a fresh crowd of people. Visit freshcrowd.com to find out more. 
That was great. I, I was going to say, who, who's who, the mentor's favorite mentor? Who's who's your yeah. who, are, who are a couple of your favorite mentors? Oh gosh, I've got so many. Oh my goodness, what a great question. Who are my mentors? Well, first and foremost, were my parents. Um, I, I think I I ha- always have to give them a shout out. They led by example, and they've just always been my biggest cheerleaders. That you know, my my dad said he would be the receptionist at my clinic, but he wouldn't wear. And this sounds very sexist. He wouldn't wear a skirt. You have to remember the man was 88. Um, (laughs) But he was a cheerleader. They were both in the audience the first time I did City Line cheering me on. Um, But there have been, you know, I do a lot of personal development. So there's a lot of people that I listen to. I, my morning routine, I read and and listen to podcasts every day. Um, So there's lots of different famous people that I follow that I, that I like. I'm trying to think of just a couple, but I also have mentors, um, personal mentors that I learned from. There have been people in television um, that I've learned a lot from. I, you know, I can't even think of certain particular names. I'm always looking to learn and to, whenever I see a skill in someone that I admire, I'm always interested in learning more from them. And I'm never too proud to, to compliment somebody and say, wow, you're really good at this. Thank you. And do you mind, can I ask you a question? Um, so who are some of my, like to, to say off the top of my head, um, you know, like a John Maxwell is somebody that I, that I like in, in terms of leadership. Um, who else? I, I love, uh, the slight edge concept. Jeff Olson is another guy that I just love because it's consistent persistence and the small things that you do that are easily to not do as, as easily as they are to do that make a difference in business and in your life. Um, but what a great question. I'm going to have to think about that and be more prepared. No worries. I mean, if you were to, what was the last podcast you listened to? What was the last podcast I listened to? Um, Aside from the Merge Marketing podcast. I, exactly. That podcast. <laughs> because I did, to be honest, I did because I did my due diligence to be on this program. I had to, I had to listen and find out what you needed from me. Um, nice. what, what was the one that I listened to last? I, um, Actually, it was something with uh, another one that I love, Mel Robbins. Actually, mm. the five yep, second rule. Right. Um, she was she's one that I love. I, I just love that you know, get out of your own way and five five four three two one do it right. Yep. Um, we can talk ourselves out of anything. That is the brain, <laughs> and all of us, especially in days that are hard like these COVID days. Oh, it's easier to not do and. So sometimes that's the way I psych myself up. So Mel Robbins was actually one that I listened to this weekend uh, that I very much enjoyed. Um, but there are so many. And I think that um, I, I just can't say enough about personal development. Always, you know, from a business perspective, from a health perspective, every day you have to pour into yourself. Self-care is critical or you cannot be a healthy entrepreneur that's successful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so as we kind of wrap up here, you know, you have shared so much incredible knowledge with us today. And, and your story is just, um, is very, is very touching and very incredible. And I would just like to to wrap up with maybe having you share one or two um, main takeaways for the business owners that are listening to this podcast today, um, from the way that you built your business, this is and personal brand. What are two, maybe three things that that they can take from what you've done over the course of your uh, 28, 30 year career and and implement or consider? Yeah. So, at the foundation of everything, be authentic and be relatable. So, uh, you know. Some of the best public speakers um, and the biggest compliments I've gotten, whether I stand on a stage to speak to hundreds of people, whether I do television or a podcast like this, and then someone sees me in, in my clinic, the biggest compliment that I get that matters to me is you're the same person mm. as you were that I saw on City Line or as you were when I saw on that stage. I think so many people make the mistake of trying, yes, we wear different hats and yes, we have to have certain boundaries and certain aspects of our business, but authenticity is critical to success. People see through when you're not being authentically who you are. And I would challenge you to recognize that who you are is enough. 
So at the foundation, be authentic and relatable. Two, be willing to do the work to build relationships. It takes time and patience and persistence. You must be persistent to fail forward and take the risks and do it again. It doesn't happen overnight, even though <laughs> you can look at someone's career and see what they've done and think, oh, aren't they lucky? Or, oh, yeah. it must have, you know, it, it, yeah, sometimes you get lucky and you have a thing happen that you think, oh, hallelujah. But at the end of the day, there's been so much foundation building over so many years that has led someone to that. So be, take risks and be persistent. And three, make sure you're passionate and having fun. Because at the end of the day, I said to you, I am more passionate now about my career than I was when I started. And I think it's so critical. We often get so caught up in the how. We forget to really focus on the why. And when we continue to go back to our why and what really fires us up, to remember why I started this to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes so much easier to be authentic, to take risks, and to create content or a business that will resonate with others. So I think, yeah, and you know what? Be accountable and and be willing to do the work. I, I, um, <laughs> I get very frustrated when I see people, I, you know, I own a practice and have seen many professionals over the years that want something yesterday and want to ride coattails and don't really want to do the work. Um, there is no get rich quick scheme anywhere. I don't care what business you're in. You've got to be willing to roll up your sleeves, get in the muck and, and do the hard work, but do it with a smile on your face, which as I always say, attitudes are contagious. Even when it's hard, when we have that attitude, you, you come out the other side with something pretty special. So I think those would be the four things. Um, patience, persistence, authenticity, um, and, and integrity. Uh, you cannot compromise integrity for anything. I've been asked to represent brands um, that could have made me a heck of a lot of money, but it went against my integrity or what I believed in. And I refuse for any amount of money you will never get your integrity back or your reputation. So, so do the work, do it authentically, do it passionately, and take a whole lot of risks. Mm -hmm. Wow, well it's, said. It's almost like it's yeah, absolutely. It's almost like uh, it's like a golf swing. You know what I mean? There's so many things you have oh. to remember to hit that good shot. You know what I mean? Like it, oh. it, when you, you speak about being authentic and relatable, and as 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 easier said than done. And, and, you know, it really is because myself, myself, my default, I'm a salesperson. Historically, I've always been in sales and, mm -hmm. and a part of being good at sales, um, for, is being a chameleon, right? Yes. And, and, yes. and depending on who you're talking to, you need to talk to them, but what gets lost in that a lot of the time is the authenticity. Mm -hmm. you know, naturally. So, um, that is, it, it's a great, and like I said, it's, it's a great takeaway and it's something you need to think about all these things at once when you go out there to create that content, to roll yeah. that video, be authentic. Cause you're absolutely right, Margaret. People see through that. They really do. And you know what? I think we were saying the same thing cause you're, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I am, you know, people will say you're a natural salesperson. The only reason I'm a natural salesperson is because I will not pitch anything that I don't authentically believe in. When I'll give you, I want to leave your viewers with one final story or your listeners to one final story because uh, this was a big learning lesson and oh man, was it ugly. Um, I was given an opportunity to, you know, I've done all this television work, but I was being authentically me. I was being asked questions as a healthcare professional. I was, I was in my element. I am not an actress where I can learn script. That is a completely different skill set. Let me tell you, that's a different skill set. And I admire it. I am not an actress. I was given an opportunity to do a commercial, a, no, sorry, a corporate video for a frozen food company out in Montreal. And a friend called me and I had given birth to my daughter and it was, she was young and, um, and I thought, well, this is kind of cool, but you know, trust your gut. There's another, there's another thing, uh, you know, trust your gut because when this particular person asked me, he said, well, 
well, you do this, you'd be great. And you know, it's, it's health related. And, and right away I bristled. I thought, oh, no, cause it's, I don't know frozen food and it's a corporate video and it's got to be, so it's going to be scripted. And, and so I went against my better judgment. I got talked into it and it was going to be decent money, but once again, what's it worth right at the end of the day. And so I flew to Montreal and I had asked time and time again of this particular person, is there anything I need to prepare? Is there a script? What are the, you know, what's the background? What do I need to be doing? And it was kind of all aloof and not a lot. And I flew to Montreal and you would not believe this guys, but they had the first ever at the plant where this video was being uh, taped this day, produced this day. They had their first ever in, well, in, not ever, but in years, um, a, an accident on the line. Um, and so there were ambulances. So we were on hold. And when I arrived, they handed me, the client handed me, honest to goodness, it was about a 15 page script. And it was technical information about how they freeze this pasta in a certain way, in a certain temperature, in a certain this and a certain that. Honest to God, I thought I was going to vomit because I'm like, are you kidding me? Now I was going to need to understand these lines like an actress would and spit them out because, because they mattered. This isn't my skill set. And I said yes to this, even though my gut said no. And guess what, toots? Now you got to pay the consequences. Oh, and there's been an industrial accident. So now you're going to wait eight hours and can stew about it because you can't tape this video yet. It was the worst experience of my life. And I don't know how we got through it. It was the wee hours of the morning. It, we went back the next day. We salvaged this. It was awful. It's not work that I'm proud of. The client ended up being okay with it. But the biggest lesson to me was you got to know your strengths. You don't have to stay in your lane. You got to be authentic, regardless of the fact that, yes, it was good money. But boy, oh boy, did it ever teach me a hard lesson that it isn't easy to do things that aren't yours. But so being a chameleon, yeah, I can sell something, but it. And sometimes you do have to wear a different hat. And that's what we were both saying, which was the same thing. In sales, you have to know your audience and you have to know how to change your messaging slightly so, so that the message is going to land on their ear properly and you're going to get the sale. But you can never compromise your own integrity and authenticity while you're doing it. Because immediately, even if they don't understand why they don't trust you, they won't trust you. Mm -hmm. They may not know why they don't but they're not going to trust you and you're not going to get a sale. But yeah. equally as true if you're yourself, people are going to be gra they're going to gravitate towards you because they know you're being you and you're being real. Love it. Love it. And and where can our uh, listeners find that YouTube link there, Margaret? Um so if you go to Margaret Wallace Duffy on YouTube, Wallace is W A L L I S uh, Duffy. Um, we have a YouTube show as well. Um, I'm on all the social media platforms, Wallace number four wellness on Instagram. Of course, hook me up on LinkedIn um, and Facebook. Um, both Wallace for Wellness has a page and Margaret Wallace Duffy. Um, you can get me everywhere, but I also just love to connect with people. And reach out to me, send me a direct message um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much, guys, for having me on. I, I I don't take these opportunities for granted. I love collaboration over competition. There's another, there's another thing I believe in business. I never believe that there's, that there's always good, healthy collaboration that elevates all of us. And I, I want to thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. And so many value bombs uh, were dropped in, in today's episode by you, <laughs> Margaret. And, and I greatly appreciate it and want to want to thank you for your time today and encourage everybody to reach out to you if, uh, if you found anything at all interesting, which I'm sure you did. Uh, I do my best to practice gratefulness every single day. And I just want you to know I'm extremely grateful for your time today. So 
We end our podcast with the same question every single time to our guest. And that is, if you could choose one person, dead or alive, to represent your brand, so essentially uh-huh. be your spokesperson, who would it be and why? Oh, my goodness. Guys, you're throwing me on the spot here. <laughs> wow. You said you listened to a previous episode. I did. but <laughs> You know what? I did. But I listened to Dr. Thappers, and I actually tuned into that one when it was happening. Um but I, oh my gosh, who would I have represent and why? Hmm. Dead or alive. Anybody Dead or alive. you want. Anyone I want. Do you know what? I absolutely love um, Michelle Obama. Ah, uh, yes. Um, because I love her inspired leadership. I love her authenticity. I love her sense of humor. I love her willingness, her guts to to push something uphill even when people don't want it. I love that she takes risks. I think there are many people actually that come to mind, but the first person that jumps out um, is Michelle Obama because I just, I just, and and I and she's a classy woman, a class act. And and when I think about what I would want people to think about me, my brand, and my mission. The, you know, a, an, a change ambassador and someone that will educate, empower, and inspire people, she comes to mind. Perfect. Yeah, she is amazing. I'll take it. All right. Well, thank you again, Margaret. We appreciate your time and uh, all the best. Thank you so much for having me and uh, be well. We're, we're better together as one. Thank you for having me. 